eyes of light, but he had seen her. Her gaze was cut into his mind. Slowly he became aware of the sweat that soaked into the underwear he'd slept in, that wet his scalp, his temples, and the pain, of course, in all the usual places, teeth, joints, head, within. But no one was coming up the stair, for here he was now, far away, delivered. And that, anyhow, was something. The angels had kept their word. He remained crouching there for a long while. Even if you live to go out and tell this, Nardo, no one will believe you. Do you think they will? No one will. No one outside of this room will ever believe the things that happened here. And the more you try to tell of what happened, the less they will believe. To make them believe, you will have to edit, to distill, to tell only the tiniest little portion of it. And when you tell only the tiniest little portion, why then, they will be inclined to think, after all, perhaps there was a reason for this. Perhaps the police sometimes need to employ certain means and measures. This was the frog-eyed one speaking, the worst of them, perhaps, one of the worst. He spoke quietly, meditatively, pausing to puff on a cigar while Nardo hung by one foot and one hand, and Frog Eyes pushed him like a swing, holding an imaginary conversation in which he pretended first to be Nardo. Let me tell you, he said to the imaginary person Nardo was supposed to be informing about this, let me tell you what these animales did to me. Listen. And then he would reply, playing the role of the person Nardo was to have been telling. Oh, come now, you can't mean this. Surely you exaggerate. What do you take me for? This is too bizarre, really. Then he interrupted himself. No, my swinging friend, he said, and gave another push. Nardo could hear the cartilage that held arm to shoulder creak and pop. No, it will be worse than that. They will not even say nothing. They will seem to listen to you with the face of great sympathy and say nothing. But in their little heads, he circled his forefinger at the side of his own skull, in their little heads they will be thinking, this man is full of the shit. He is nuts. That is what they will think of your tales, my swinging friend. No one likes the little boy who tells tales out of class. And he removed the cigar from his lips and smiled. And Nardo began to scream even before the glowing tip pressed against his flesh. So that's the, uh, the introduction to Bernardo Green, and uh, then I would like to read a kind of an introduction to Mikola Ibsen, who is the woman that he falls in love with, or who he uh, sees on the street, actually, he sees him at a cafe, and becomes greatly enamored of the woman with eyes of blue light. And in this scene, um, she is, if I can find it, she is visiting um, her uh, parents who are in a nursing home, and um, let me see. And uh, the father is um, is uh, dying of cancer, but his mind is intact, and the mother is completely physically healthy, but um, her mind is, is gone. Uh, she's complete dementia. And this is from chapter 5 of the book. On the sixth floor, Mikola tapped at her father's door and peeked in. He lay there, as always, half propped up against the headboard, his right hand clutching the little trapeze above his bed, strings of sinew taut in his scrawny arm. The room stank of cancer. He looked up from a slim paperback book in his left hand, held open by his thumb and his one good eye crackled in his wasted face. Mikola rolled her mother's wheelchair briskly through the doorway, announcing, Look who's come to visit with you, father. His eye lightened. Don't you look lovely, Lisa, he said, his words thick in his toothless mouth. Mikola! Doesn't your mother look lovely? 
Her mother sniffed. It smells in here. Nicholas' father said nothing, only glared from among the turned tables of his consciousness, clinging to the trapeze with his right arm amid the reek of his own dying. He jiggled the book in his free hand as though he might fling it. Who is he? Her mother asked, tipping back her head to look up at Mikola behind the wheelchair. Is he the fraud? Oh, that's good, her father muttered in his gravelly voice. You really have the power now, don't you? And you use it. Yes, said her mother mildly, so that Mikola wondered for a moment if it was all an act a way to justify her rejection of him, a screen of confusion to hide behind. She tried to signal her father to be easy, but her mother whispered loudly, He needs a bath. He looks like a sack of potatoes. Do we have to stay here? No, said her husband in a phlegmy bark. Feel free to go. The exertion left him gulping for air, his frail chest heaving, bald now, Mikola saw, through his pajama lapels gone the curly red hair she had always thought so beautiful and that her mother had made faces about. The skin was now puckered, bald white blotched with purple. Dad, Nicola pleaded, hoping to make him recognize that his wife's mind was gone, for his was strong enough to see that. But he cut her off, snapping, weak, weak and simple, as always, a woman's love is weakness. And look, he added, she's even smiling. This is how it is in Denmark now, by God. Smile and smile and cast the bullets. Holding up the book alongside his face as though to witness, he smiled poisonously and hissed, pernicious woman, frailty. Now his wife was looking elsewhere. Her smiling face was aimed toward the window, the yellowing sky. The view from my room, she said, is much better than this one. Mikola punished her father with silence, let it extend until she could no longer uh, hear it, then asked, Do you need anything, Dad? Yeah, he snapped. About 30 meters of intestine and a new asshole. She chuckled despite herself and was surprised and relieved to see in the turn of his lips that he appreciated her appreciation of his irony. She admired that he could muster even that much of a smile, even that much irony. His strength was not depleted. Yet perhaps that was not good either, she thought, observing how desperately he clung to the trapeze suspended above his bed. She moved closer and sat on the edge. Her fingers touched the taut strings of muscle in his right arm. She stroked the papery, veiny skin on the back of his hand, clenched around the bar of the trapeze. This close the smell was very bad. Don't you get